Sam Phillips was president of Sun Record Company. Headquartered in Memphis, Sam had made the company successful by identifying new country stars before anyone else saw them. So Sam thought Fortune had smiled on him again with his newest rising star. The young country boy walked into his office one day in 1955, relatively obscure but loaded with talent. The guitar-playing rockabilly style was evident in his first recording. DJs loved it. And Sam Phillips was now positive he had picked the next big star. In order to free up money for more promotion, Sam sold the rights to another one of his singers, another guitar-playing country type whose record sales were slumping badly. Sam sold the rights to this act to RCA Records for $35,000, a lot of money in 1955. The bet seemed to pay off almost immediately when Sam's investment produced the single that would go on to top the pop, R&B, and country single charts. That song was Blue Suede Shoes. To anyone who asked, Sam would unabashedly say, I saw it coming. What he could not see coming, however, was the car accident early the next year that put his newly recognized talent, Carl Perkins, in the hospital for almost a year. That's right. Carl Perkins was the one who first recorded Blue Suede Shoes. Carl Perkins was the singer who Sam Phillips bet the farm on. And Elvis Presley? He was the singer whose rights were sold to RCA for $35,000, who remade Blue Suede Shoes in 1956 while Sam Perkins was still in the hospital. Now, you probably have never heard the name Sam Perkins or, I'm sorry, Sam Phillips or Carl Perkins. See, I don't know him either. But I bet you you heard the name Elvis before. And their stories are inseparably linked. In many ways, the stories of Sam Phillips and Carl Perkins made it inevitable that Elvis would have a story. And we all know his but don't know theirs. That's the premise of our series of messages leading up to Easter person of interest and the messages contained in this series are all about the story of Easter. And everybody knows the story of Easter. But we are identifying the people, the, the lives, the stories that led up to Easter that you've probably never heard of, or at least never connected with Easter. And it turns out that those stories and those lives, if we are to understand them correctly, make the events of Easter almost inevitable. And so last week, we started with Abraham. And we went all the way back, a thousand of ye- thousands of years before Easter ever happened, to this promise that God made to a nobody shepherd in the middle of nowhere named Abram. And, and that promise was that God's blessing would not rely on the faithfulness of human beings, but on the faithfulness of God himself. And so last week we we left with our stickers up on the crosses here because there's a lot of Abraham in me. And what we said was, even when I doubt God, especially when I doubt me, I can trust God because of God's promise that led to the cross, that ended up in the resurrection, that changes my life. Now, that was last week. If you weren't here, go online. You can listen to the whole thing. Week number two, the person of interest, is a name that I bet you most of you have heard. The name is Herod. But the story, I bet you don't know. And the story is inseparably linked to the story of Easter. And the story is one of a collision, a collision of two kingdoms. Herod represents a kingdom. And as he is introduced to us, we'll figure out pretty quickly that his kingdom and the kingdom that Jesus came to proclaim are not the same one. And that there is an inevitable collision that occurs that leads up and makes Easter inevitable. Jesus' mission put him on a collision course. And to understand Easter, you need to understand that course. 
Now, I, I used the word kingdom a couple of times already, and so let me explain what I mean when I say kingdom. You, the only way we use that today is maybe the magic kingdom, right? <laughs> you think of Mickey Mouse and whatever and all. That's not it. Kingdom, biblically speaking, means the sphere of your influence, the, where your rule and reign are in effect. It's where what you say goes, and we've all got them, right? Yeah, everyone here has a kingdom where what you say goes. Some of your kingdoms are very small, right, and shrinking, <laughs> it feels like. Some of them are expanding where what you say goes. Ken Davis is a comedian who talks about maybe one of the expressions of understanding what a kingdom is is a parent driving a minivan. Have you been there? Kids in the back seat aren't getting along. They're fighting over their kingdom. And where one kingdom stops and the other one starts, you know, he's in my kingdom. He's touching me, you know. And, uh, and so then you as a parent from the front seat kingdom try to uh, alleviate issues of the battle going on. So what do you do? You, your dads, have you been there? You reach back like this. I, I, don't make me come back there. Don't make me pull this van over. Right? And what do they do? The, the kids retreat to the little corner of their kingdom. <laughs> Where you, where you cannot get at them, right? Ken Davis says a little tap on the brakes brings them right back into play. <laughs> Gives a whole new meaning to thy kingdom come, <laughs> right? So, I'm not sure what just happened here. My thing fell off. There we go. Uh, kingdom. Jesus says, as he arrives on the planet, there's a new kingdom I'm announcing. And it's here. What's he saying? The rule and reign of God where what God says goes, is now available for you to live in. The problem is that that necessarily is in conflict with other kingdoms that are already in place. Do you see that? Whenever someone shows up and announces a new kingdom, the ones that are already in place are threatened. And so, listen, listen. So many people that you know and that I know, maybe you're sitting here, we tend to picture Jesus as this mild-mannered, sage guru who walked around and told everybody to be nice. To, to, can't we all just get along? Listen to me. No one ever gets crucified for walking around telling people to be nice. People get crucified when power systems are threatened. And that's what happened. That's what led to Easter. And unless you see it, you'll miss the point of Easter. So uh, I, I want to talk to you today, a person of interest, and our person today is Herod, and Herod represents a kingdom. And that kingdom is on a collision course with the kingdom of God. So uh, I want to introduce the kingdoms to you, and, and I want you to, to meet Herod. And, so, and I want to describe these two kingdoms in this way. There's two people there's two places, and there's two plans. And, and, and I want to show you that. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be going through a bunch of different verses in the, the Gospel of Luke, starting in Luke chapter 3, which is where we first hear about Herod. Now, let me give you a little background. When you hear the name Herod, you probably think of Herod's dad, who was Herod the Great, right? And it's sort of, so he was Herod, they named his kids Herod. And they named their, it's like George Foreman named all his kids George. Similar thing. But this is not Herod the Great that we're going to read about. It's Herod Antipas. Herod the Great was the king of the Jews, so named by Rome, at the time of Jesus' birth. You remember that story, maybe. And so all the way back at the birth of Christ, there is conflict that's brewing. Because remember the story? That the wise men show up in Jerusalem and they ask Herod the Great, where's the one that's born king of the Jews? What's his response? King of the Jews, that's me. No, no, there's a new one. And what does Herod do? He searches for him and he sends out, he makes this unbelievably cruel edict to kill all the boys under two years old. Why? Because his kingdom is being threatened. And so all the way back, and Herod didn't just kill all those boys. He killed some of his own boys. In fact, when he felt threatened by his son that was in succession to be king, he would kill his, his own son. And so much so that Caesar was quoted as saying, it's better to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. 
Which is funny because the, the Greek word for pig is euios, and the Greek word for son is thuios. So he was saying it's better to be Herod's euios than his thuios. Which is a really snappy saying in Greek, but not, not so much in English, apparently. <laughs> we'll keep going. Um, so this, that's Herod the Great. Herod the Great, when he dies, has three living sons, Philip, Archelaus, and then number three is Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is given the territory of Galilee. And that's where Jesus grew up. In fact, most of the ministry of Jesus in the Gospels takes place in Galilee, where Herod's kingdom is in place. Where Jesus comes proclaiming a new kingdom has arrived. So let's look at Luke chapter 3. The first time that we hear about Herod Antipas in the scripture. It says this. Verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Interia and some other place I can't pronounce, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, only time Texas is in the Bible, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now just stop there for a second. Why all the details? Why all of these names that are hard to pronounce? Is he getting paid by the word here? What's going on with Luke? No, he, all of those people are people of great power in the first century. And he just goes down the list. There's Caesar, there's Pilate, there's Herod, there's Philip. There's Caiaphas, all people that wield great power with big kingdoms and kingdoms that are expanding. It's interesting, though, that Herod is called Herod the Tetrarch. You know what Tetrarch means? Tetra is a quarter. And so he says, Herod, who's a quarter king. In other words, he didn't get all of the kingdom that Herod the Great was given control over. He just got a, he's like a little quarter pounder king. So a little quarter king. And so already you can understand that Herod is predisposed to want more, to want more power, to want more control, to want more kingdom. And then John, uh, Luke says, the word of God came, but not to any of those people. Not to Caesar, not to Pilate, not to any of Herod's boys, not to that. Who's, the word of God comes to, to this non-player, this person with very little power. He comes to this untitled, unconnected, locust-eating, rag-wearing guy named John. And now, 2,000 years later, we name our kids John and our salads Caesar. <laughs> so you can see how that worked out. Because, 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 listen, here's why. Here's why. It would make no sense if you had told them on that day that the name that would be revered and adopted would be John. And the name that would be an afterthought would be Caesar. Why? Because their two kingdoms looked so despairingly different. One had great power. One had almost no power. And these kingdoms were on a collision course. So before we move on to person number two, two people, two places, two plans, let me make sure you understand. The more that you let your kingdom get in the way, the less likely you are to hear from God. Hmm? You can have great power and control over lots of areas of your life. It may be the thing that's keeping you from hearing God. It was the case here. All right. So person number one is Herod. Person number two is this guy, John, who the word of God came to. And so John, we always put a, a name, on a descriptor on the end of it. John the Baptist, right, which is, was not, didn't mean he was a, goes to the Baptist church. That didn't exist back then. It means he was a baptizer, and he was Jesus' cousin. And so uh, his mother Elizabeth and Mary were sisters. And so John shows up. 
as the announcer of this new kingdom that is being put in place that Jesus has come to launch. And so in verse 18 of Luke chapter 3, we hear what happens with, with John. It says, verse 18, that, and with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. What good news? The good news that there's a new kingdom that's available. You can live in it if you want. Verse 19, but when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things that he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Here it is. See, it doesn't take very long for these two kingdoms to collide. The word of God comes to this nobody with no power who's proclaiming a new kingdom. And the guy with all the power who wants to control outcomes gets rebuked. There's this collision right off the bat. And the collision is spearheaded by Herod's marriage to this woman Herodias that's got lots of issues. Not the least of which is it's bad names. So it's Herod and Herodias. It's kind of weird, right? And so other than that, the problems are that they were both married to other people when they got married. She was actually married to his brother, Philip. That's a problem. She was also the daughter of another brother. That's also a problem. So if you're keeping track at home, when she marries him, she will be his wife, his niece, and his sister-in-law all at the same time. It's like Jerry Springer, you know, is here. Um, and so it says he's already a bad guy. And when he gets called out, when these kingdoms start to collide, he takes care of the problem. How? He puts John in prison. And he thinks, well, I guess that's the end of that. He thinks, my kingdom just got a little bigger. Where I say goes, just got a little bigger. What he was unaware of was that God's hand can't be forced, God's will can't be thwarted, and God's kingdom cannot be stopped. But he had not yet learned that lesson. There's a little bit of Herod in me. I have trouble learning those same lessons. How about you? So these two people represent two kingdoms, Herod and John. Let's press pause on that story for a second because I want to show you two places that represent these two kingdoms. First place is a city that I'd never heard of before last week. It's called Sephorus. And Sephorus was a town in Galilee that was built by Herod. It was enormous inside. Just in the last 20 years or so, they've excavated this city, and they've begun to understand the scope of what he built. Herod was building a monument to his kingdom. He wanted everyone to know how much power and authority he had. Sephorus was a city that said, look at my kingdom. It, 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 the, the center street that went down the city, that they've uncovered, it was 44 feet wide, um, stone paved. It was like a four-lane highway going down the middle of this city. There was an elaborate sewage, elaborate sewage, I didn't say that right three times in a row, elaborate sewage system that was in place underneath the roads. So all of the sewage was washed out of town. There was a 5,000-seat amphitheater that they've uncovered in the town of Sephorus. It was called the Ornament of Galilee. And it was all about the kingdom of Herod and what he was building. In fact, most uh, historians believe that Herod owned about two-thirds of the land in the whole region of Galilee. Power on display. That's place number one, Sephorus. Place number two, you've probably all heard of. It's Nazareth. Heard of that? Yeah, it's a place where Jesus grew up. Nazareth, however, was very, very different <laughs> Than Sephorus. As a matter of fact, do this. Turn to the person next to you and give a guess. How many people do you think lived in Nazareth in Jesus' day? Just go ahead. Turn around. Five seconds. Say it out loud on your mark. Set. Go. Did you guess? All right. Good. Two hundred. Two hundred. You get it right. It, it was in effect. It was just several extended families. 
It was very, very poor, very small, the, 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 no uh, comforts of home. The, the sewage was just dumped in the street. Dirt floors. Jesus was so poor when Mary and Joseph dedicated him at the temple at age 12. We know that it's recorded that they gave a pigeon as their offering. The very lowest rung. Incredibly poor. And growing up in Nazareth came with a stigma attached to it. You might remember when Jesus is calling his first disciples. Andrew goes to Nathaniel and he says, We found the one whom God has promised. Jesus from Nazareth. And what does Nathaniel say? Nazareth? <laughs> what good comes from Nazareth? That's ridiculous. Uh, the historian Josephus, who wrote in the first century, not a, not a Christian uh, writer, but wrote at the same time that Jesus' ministry uh, was developing, he wrote about 45 different towns in uh, Galilee. Guess how many times he mentions Nazareth? Zero. <laughs> It doesn't even show up on the map. That's where Jesus spent 90% of his time. Nazareth. Two places. Sephoris and Nazareth. They represent two different kingdoms. Oh yeah, and I forgot to tell you. They're just a little more than three miles apart. And you could see Sephoris from Nazareth. It sat up on a hill. And served as this reminder to where power was located and who had it. And it turns out that the people in Nazareth had a name for Sephoris. You know what they would call it? A city on a hill that can't be hidden. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Matthew 5.14. When Jesus, who grew up in Nazareth, called his disciples together and was casting vision for what his movement would become, for what the kingdom of God would become. He said this, you are going to become a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Boom. Can't be two. And here's what I'm going to tell you. That 20 years ago, Sephora lay under about 20 feet of rubble. They had to dig it all around it to find it. And Jesus' city on a hill? Still growing, still available, still proclaiming. These two places represent this collision of two kingdoms. Two kingdoms represented by two people in two places. And let me show you the two plans. They're so different. Herod's plan is easy to identify, isn't it? Control, command, direct, Dictate, use power to get more power. That's the plan. And before you throw him under the bus, <laughs> there's a little Herod in me. There's a little Herod in you, probably. And there's so many decisions that I make in my life that are trying to control outcomes, trying to control what people think, trying to control the way that it's going to go, trying to predict the future, trying to acquire power and authority, expanding my kingdom. I do the very same thing. And here's the kicker. Then I ask Jesus to help me <laughs> expand my kingdom. <laughs> help me gain some control, Jesus. Help me do this. There's a little Herod in me. There's probably a little Herod in you. And it doesn't matter whether it's at work or in your family or in relationships. All of us have a little bit of that in us. And back to the story. Herod's plan is on display for everyone to see. He locks up John, and he says, there, mm, power is expanding. And so John sends a delegation back to Jesus. Remember this? And John says, Jesus, uh, I need to know, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Now, why did he all of a sudden get a little fuzzy on this? Because from the time that John was an infant, before that, when he was in his mother's womb, he knew who Jesus was. <laughs> he, he leapt when Mary came into his presence, even before he was born. First time he saw Jesus, without any introduction, he said, look, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Now, all of a sudden, he's a little fuzzy. Why? Because he's in jail. <laughs> and he's thinking, um, if you're the new king, why am I in jail? 
if you're the one with the power, why aren't you using it? And so he sends his delegation to Jesus. And Jesus answers this way. In effect, he says, oh, tell him I got plenty of power. T tell him what I'm doing. Tell him what you see. The blind receive their sight. The lame start walking again. Prisoners are released that from uh, their captivity of, of things that they've been dealing with. Tell them I got plenty of power. It's just not used in the same way, the way that you're used to. My kingdom works on a completely different way. So they send the news back to John in prison. And then Jesus, in Luke chapter 7, turns after giving that account in verse 24, and he talks to the crowd. This is what he says. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. Like in what city, would you think? Sephoris. Yeah. No. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. There is a new kingdom, Jesus says. And it works the absolute opposite of the ones that you're used to. Now, you need to know something here about the, what Jesus is saying. Because often in the first century, a ruler would have their own money in their kingdom. So in Galilee, there was Herod money that was traded in that region. And often, the ruler would put their picture on their money, right? You got presidents on our bills and all of that, right? And oftentimes, instead of a picture of their face, which was hard to mint at that time, they would choose a symbol that represented that leader. The symbol that Herod had chosen to represent himself was a reed, was a, an Egyptian reed that grew by the, the Mediterranean. And so Jesus says, after sending word back, I've got plenty of power, go report that to John. He said, which kingdom are you looking for? Did you come out here looking for a reed swayed by the wind? One who wears fine clothes and lives in palaces? Who does everyone know that he's talking about? Herod. And he says, no, you're not looking for that kingdom. You've had quite enough of that kingdom probably. There's another kingdom. It's led by a completely different kind of king. And John was pointing you to it. And so Herod gets word of this. And Jesus uh, is not in any way backing down. And so he kills John. Has his head chopped off. Presented to him on a platter. Jesus hears about it. And what do you think he did? Ooh, I better hide. He went back to Galilee. He brought the fight right to him. Because Jesus was about to reveal a very different plan. Herod's plan was really clear. Control, dictate, use power to get power. I'll kill him. And as he did it, I'm sure he thought my kingdom just expanded a little more. And Jesus went to Galilee to reveal a very different plan. Look at Luke chapter 13. Last scripture we'll look at. In Luke 13, we find a bunch of Pharisees who are warning Jesus. Look at verse 31. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Why? Because that's the plan. That's the plan. I will use my power to get more power, except he didn't know. That God's hand can't be forced. That God's will can't be thwarted. That God's kingdom can't be stopped. 
And so how do you think Jesus responds? Oh, no. I didn't know that. No. Listen to how he responds. Verse 32. He replied, you go tell that fox that I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. What? If you can't hear in Jesus' voice the defiance, you're not listening. See, maybe when you hear uh, Jesus call him a fox, you think, well, in our day, a fox represents someone who's cunning or sly. Not in the first century. In the first century, the fox was an antithesis of another animal, a lion. See, the lion was the majestic king of the jungle. And after a kill and the lion had had his fill, the fox would often come and sneak in and try to grab a little and then act like they made the kill, right? The, the, the fox was a lion wannabe. And Jesus says, you tell that fox, you tell that Caesar wannabe, you tell, if he thinks that those threats are going to make me back down, he has severely misinterpreted who I am. I'm not going to stop today. I'm not going to stop tomorrow. And then what does he say? I'm going to end up in Jerusalem and die. Why? Why? Because his plan is exactly the opposite as Herod's plan. Because his kingdom works exactly opposite of Herod's kingdom. It's amazing that he calls him a fox. That's amazing. What's more amazing is what Jesus calls himself in verse 34. Look at verse 34. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, where he's heading to die. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Herod's a fox, and Jesus says, I'm a hen. (laughs) What? (laughs) What, What chance does a hen have when the fox gets in the hen house? What, what, are you going to peck him to death? (laughs) No. What's the only option for a hen when the fox gets in the hen house to protect the chicks? Cover them up. Offer your own body. And that is exactly what Jesus knows is going to happen. And he's planning it. Don't you feel sorry for Jesus? He's... Because there's one day, when does the hen beat the fox? On the third day. Because on the third day is resurrection day. And Jesus says, you can't even begin to comprehend the power that is getting released because I'm giving up my life. That's great. You killed John. Let's see how far that takes you. But when I give up my life, it will release a power that you will not believe and the world has never seen. And I love our Lord (laughs) when he says that. I think there is a kingdom that's built the opposite way. And you can live in it if you want because of who Christ is. And I got a lot of Herod in me. (laughs) I got a lot of my own kingdom building going on. And sometimes my kingdom crashes in to the kingdom of God. And it's not pretty. And sometimes I don't like it. But I'm really clear on this truth. God's hand can't be forced. God's will can't be thwarted. And God's kingdom cannot be stopped. 